Hey everybody, this is Bernie, and I am going to be playing Besiege with Marcus Laporte. Hey Marcus. Hey, how are you doing? I'm doing well, how are you doing? I'm doing well, thank you. So Marcus, you and I have been threatening to do a game time for a really long period of time. We have. And we wanted to find something that we could play where it was a building game or a construction game of some time. Because why don't you explain to everybody what you do for Rooster Teeth? Sure, so I'm the production designer, so essentially I'm, I'm here to make all your scripted works come to life. So I buy all the props, I build all the sets, we design all the um, uh, the special effects, we do all the kind of the fun stuff, the art stuff. And I have to say, Marcus, like you are one of the employees at Rooster Teeth that the moment you were hired or we started working with you, because you, you worked with us on a contract basis first, or on a, I should say more for you, a project basis. Yeah. And then uh, you were hired at Rooster Teeth. The moment you got hired at Rooster Teeth, everyone at the company was like, immediately like, hooked their claws and you was like, I need Marcus to help me do what I'm doing. And, yeah. You know, things like the off topic well, podcast set, the free play set, mm -hmm. just everything in general. How do you make the physical environments, you know, even better. And I'm going to turn this down a little bit so we don't have too much besieged in our background. Sure. Because we're recording the audio from the game. So yeah. what, was, what was that experience like for you coming into Rooster Teeth and like having everyone instantly take to you? Why don't we start this real quick then? Yeah, let's, you want, yeah, yeah you, you can do whichever level you want. Let's, I mean, I've done the first few, so let's, let's start at maybe number three. So you're familiar with the game and how it works? A, a little bit. I'm, I'm, I wouldn't say I'm an expert, but I know how to... I know how to build some things. Have you seen the like some of the YouTube videos where people have made like outrageous correct Yes. Oh yeah. No, I'm nowhere near that level. Super jealous I of might, that. You might not be able to go to that one. Oh, should we start at the first locked. one? I yeah, that's fine. No, that's that's we can do that. It's, so I'm, I'm a I'm a besieged novice. Oh, see, like the one I started. This, see, you're way ahead of me. This is this is like this is like looks like hard stuff. Oh, why don't we? You can back out if you no, want to. No, no, no. This is challenging. This is fun. Okay. I love it. Okay, so let's see. Uh, do you, is this still the same button? Yep, it is. Sorry, I'm just like trying to understand all the control. I'm using mine on a laptop, so the buttons are just a tiny bit different. How do I? We want to hold I, you accountable. Let's see. How do I turn? How do you do on a laptop? Well, I use Option, but it's a, you know it's a Mac, so. Oh right. So I would use either Alt or Control, and not use that Windows button. Ah, that's it. Go. That's what I needed. Okay. Yeah, the Windows button in uh, in PC is just a nightmare button. <laughs> yeah. When they first introduced it on keyboards, I remember it was like back in the Doom era, and you would accidentally hit this Windows button, and it would drop you out of Doom. In, Take you in a horrible in, yeah, place. Yeah, and you'd, of course, get killed yeah. in, while you were gone. So I noticed that I, when I first did this, I, I realized that I had to... I didn't put any braces anywhere, and so the first time I did it, I just kind of... Ended up the whole thing fell apart. It's like it turned it turned on. It did some cool stuff. Some fire spit out. It was really awesome, but then it pretty much turned to nothing. So, the bra Adam Ellis was nice enough to show me how to use the braces. Oh, was he really? Yeah, I, I kept Your clicking on buddy? it. Yeah, yeah, he's face exactly. That's kind of who I've been. I was like, I need help. So okay, I've got some braces. Let's see. I'm gonna do some cannons. I think uh, weaponry. Let's do some cannons up top. And you know what this reminds me of watching you do this? It reminds me of just one of the many projects that you've helped make better is the uh, Orcs Must Die campaign where you guys oh, built yeah. all these props that look similar to this. Mm -hmm. They're like siege machines. Um, you guys didn't build a trebuchet, but you built like a wooden spike wall. We did all that stuff for that short that we did. We did, yeah. All that stuff is built um, from styrofoam mostly. You know, the, the, the good part about, about camera and movies is it doesn't have to be real. It just needs to look real. Right. So as long as you can make it look the part, then you can pretty much get away with it. As long as it doesn't have functioning parts, uh -huh. uh, you can kind of get away with quite a bit. So, yeah, it's all hand sculpted out of styrofoam. Uh, now, when you say hand sculpted out of styrofoam, like what did you do? Did you just buy a huge block of styrofoam? Yes. We really? Yes. We start with an eight foot by four foot by three foot block of styrofoam. Eight foot by three foot by four foot. Yes. Wow. It's a big giant the refrigerator. It, it, bigger than a refrigerator, really, because wow. it's eight feet tall. Yeah. So yeah, it's a, it's, it's a very large chunk of foam. Uh, and then... And do you have a guy for that? Like, I got a styrofoam we, guy? We do. Yeah, of <laughs> course we do. Like, yeah, we have a guy Mark, for everything. Mark is so funny because, like, so many conversations we, we have, it's like, hey, man, you know it'd be crazy if we could, like, levitate this thing in the middle of the office and then it would float there for a couple weeks? He's like, well, let me talk to my uh, magnets guy <laughs> and see what he can do for us. Yeah, no, I, I pride myself on having, uh, you know, other artists and, 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 you know, skilled workers that know what they're doing, uh, you know, I can't emphasize team enough. Art department is, um, you know, being 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 in charge of a department means a lot, and there's a lot of responsibility on me. However, I can't do any of this really without without a whole crew of people that are 
skilled in their own little niche markets. Right. Like they so, can be building this thing for you while you're chatting away with me here. Yeah. yeah. Um, what are you building? See. So I'm just, you know, I don't think I went up high enough, but I have this thing. You can thing drag like, the thing up, I think. Yeah, you can. Well, I need to, I guess I need to add some parts. Grab so. that little arrow. Key. There you go. Why don't I get rid of these wheels and then. So you're trying to take out. Um, in Besiege, you try to build these siege machines to then take out uh, this castle or, you know, kill all the guys on the screen or destroy a certain amount of the buildings. And. I say siege machines, but siege machines are meant to be for a siege, which is a long period of time. These are just devices that just destroy everything in their path, basically. Yeah, we're just making, you know, destructive devices, I feel like. It's the main, it's kind of the main... Using archaic technology. <laughs> um, but you've been working on teams for a long time, though, too. Like, you're, yes. you came from a long history of production before you came to Rooster Teeth. That's, you... that's correct. Yeah, I spent about a decade over at Troublemaker Studios. So you're probably familiar with a lot of those movies, Spy Kids 2, 3, 4, or the whole Spy Kids series, really. But when I came in was Spy Kids 2. Mm -hmm. um, we did Predators, Death Proof. Uh, let's see, what else did we did? Shark Boy and Lava Girl. Sin City was in there? Sin City, yeah. I headed up the prop shop for Sin City. Um, and that was actually a lot of fun. That was actually probably one of my favorite movies that I worked on. Yeah? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Well, it's such an interesting aesthetic at the end. I mean, do your props have to look like finished products? Um, for the most part. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's still real life, still still live action. But what was really great was Frank had done such a beautiful job doing the comics that it was really easy for us to figure out what things were supposed to be and what they were supposed to look like. Um, something really interesting about Frank is when we didn't know what something was, we, we went over with the comic book, we went over to his trailer, and we said, hey, what is this? You know, like, is this... Is this a real thing? And mm -hmm. he's like, oh, yeah, that's a, you know, 1972 era Montgomery Ward couch. And we'd be like, really? And sure enough, we'd go look it up. It's that fucking couch. Really? Yeah, he was very specific. He, he holds on to old catalogs uh -huh. and, um, like, old advertisements and will use period... Uh, period items in his comics. Well, it's the kind of thing that'll lend, yeah. it's, you know, give you built-in authenticity, right? Yeah. Oh, it's great. I mean, everybody was was kind of blown away when when he we went in there as a group and we we're like, "What is this?" Did it make your job harder? Or make your job easier? Uh, no, it definitely made it easier. Easier. Okay. Yeah, yeah, because there's there's somewhat of what we do is subject to interpretation. You know, you may see a prop or a set piece completely different than I do, and it's up to me to find that happy medium to figure out where we, you know, to get on the right page. But Frank was had a very clear vision. Uh -huh. So it was like, yeah, it needs to be like that. Yeah. You know, at one point I was like, is this the RoboCop gun? Like, this guy's holding the RoboCop gun, right? He's, and he starts laughing. He's like, yeah, that's the RoboCop gun. <laughs> and, and, and I was like, what is the connection with that? And he's like, oh, I wrote the first RoboCop script. You know, or I was, I was, you know I was, you know, involved in the, you know, a couple of drafts of the first and second. So he's taking movie. it back. So, yeah. So he was like, I just felt like using it. Yeah, there you go. So that was pretty cool. All right, let's put this thing on the ground and see if we can do anything. Like yeah, and Troublemaker um, Studios, uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with production company names, that's Robert Rodriguez's studio um, where you know he, he started here at UT in Austin, made a $7,000 movie down in Mexico all pretty much all by himself, all right. and then built it into a big studio that's literally right next door to us. And Marcus... We actually oh so is this like a can you're gonna fire up? Yeah, well I'm gonna try. Yeah, Give I've got I've got three cans. And I got flamethrowers, so I'm feeling like this is you've got this. Yeah. Anyway, that's, that's you got my I, vote. I I would give up if this. Thing I got some braces. Um, we'll see how this goes. The flame. But, um, <laughs> so it's gonna roll. The yeah, flamethrowers aren't gonna do it's much. Got that motor. Difference. I guess I gotta I gotta turn them a little, don't I? Um, I don't Go into build mode. Hit Oops. stop in the top left. Oh, oh right. Yeah. There yeah, you go. There you go. Okay, so I gotta. Let's, let's put it like that angle right there. there. All right, let's drop him down. Let's hit play. All right, I'm gonna hit an arrow. I think C and Y, I believe, are my are my guys. Only you know what? I'm gonna get a side view so that I know. So I got a better view when to hit the buttons. Okay, are we ready? I'm ready. All right. Let's... Oh, here we go. All right. Do the flamethrowers. Well. It's not so good, is it? They've, the structural integrity on this <laughs> island is a little bit better. Uh-oh. You're speaking of structural uh -oh. integrity. I can only go forward. This is bad. You know what's so funny, too, because when I see a see siege machine in this game, it reminds me so much of props in, in a movie that it's like, it's supposed to do one thing, and it's like, then when you're on set, you're like, oh, well, we want to back it up. And yeah. someone will go, like, you can't back this yeah. thing up. That's not, there's no way that's yeah. going to happen. We didn't engineer for that. And, uh, and we no ran one. into that uh, <laughs> with the, uh, it's not an episode that's come out yet as we're recording this, but it might be out by the time uh, this this is released, oh. which is the Warthog emergency. Yeah, that's true. And uh, we, had to, we had to work with the Warthog <laughs> that we had. And it was funny watching you deal with that thing because 
everyone loves the Warthog, but you were like, yeah, well, this is a cosmetic, like, reskin. Yeah, well, I know everyone else thought, saw the Warthog as being this, you know, super, you know, special sacred item, and to me, I was just like, ah, it's just a, it's just a, you know, a forerunner with a, with a bunch of fiberglass on it. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, yeah, I guess I was a little biased. I, I, I am a, I, I have a tendency to look at things as objects and not as I don't take things sentimental because if I did then everything that I do and make will get thrown in the trash and I'll be sad about it. Sure, it's the same thing so. that happens when you do editing as well is like nothing is precious really and if, you, if, if if things are precious you really can't do your job right. Yeah, you you really you can't you can't hold on to um, you can't hold on to, to that stuff. If you take it too seriously you'll be too sad when we blow it up. Right, there you go. <laughs> right, which is one of those things though too that that's pretty funny to me because I see the amount of work and uh, care that you guys put into designing things as well. Yeah. And you'll you'll like why don't we talk about the first project we worked on together? Okay. Which was Laser Team. That's yeah. how we first met. Yeah. Is that we were trying to figure out how we were going to build these props, which were very important to the story, and we were trying <laughs> to figure out how these have to look way better than everything else that's in this world because this is the only thing that's not made by humans. So how are we going to do that? And we met right. you, and you were talking us through the process of how you're going to get that done. Yeah, no, it's 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 really pretty pretty hard. Um, anything that's not supposed to be made, you know, by man has a whole different set of rules and a thought process that has to go into it. You know, aliens don't use screws. They don't yeah. they don't use rivets. Mm -hmm. They don't use any of these things that we're familiar to seeing. So they got a magnet guy. <laughs> yeah, or who knows? Yeah. They got some kind of technology we've never heard of. So I, I you know, at some point you have to kind of. You have to kind of extrapolate on the script more so than the script is giving you. Right. You know, so it's like, okay, well, I've got this world, I've got this universe, I've got to kind of build, but I don't really have any rule sets or any, you know, any. There's no real guides telling me what, what what's what's okay and what's not okay. So you have to kind of establish your own. So usually we start with a color palette. We start with um, shapes or lines, like forms that we like. Mm -hmm. Like for example, the warg had very angular, pointed faceted um, lines, very sort of sharp lines, you know, and on purpose. Um, the Antarian language was white and blue and clean and curves, you know, like sexy curves was kind of the idea there. Um, so that's kind of the distinction there, and that's how we were able to sort of give you guys two, you know, clear universes that are coming from two, you know, spectrums. Yeah, but, and, we, and I love that. I mean, the approach on it is great. Where do you like? Where do you draw from that? I mean, do you just consume a lot of content yourself? I mean, yeah. Do you kid that grew up like watching all sci-fi movies? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, and sci-fi is kind of my kind of my like, not I wouldn't say it's my focus, but it's certainly where my my, my personal interests are yeah. in in movies in general. Um, always love sci-fi. I have an obsession with space in general. Would love to go there one day if I can e just even taste the edge of it. In like oh, we a, made you, play you know, medieval games. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so. no, you know what I mean though. Yeah. It's just like if I could even it, VR right now is actually providing quite a bit of um, fun in that arena right now. Well, how do you? I mean, you're yeah. very your art is very physical, it definitely. And then a yeah. lot of times your art is then taken and made into uh, digital assets, mm -hmm. but they're mainly meant to recreate the stuff that you make in the real world. Correct. Or, and nowadays maybe that's sick. That process starts with digital and goes to physical. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. There's you know? A, it goes back and forth. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it kind of depends on how effects heavy any one project really is um, a lot of times at this point you know directors at uh, their expectation their their expectations are pretty high so a lot of times prop makers and production designers will use a 3d modeling program to get on the on the same ballpark because mm -hmm. it's less expensive now to do that than it is to, to build three different versions and then all sit around in a room and, and talk about them but you're also so, the kind of guy that's like if you have to tackle a problem design wise it's more likely that you're gonna bust out an angle grinder and duct tape, then you're going to sit down at a tablet and do that stuff. Sure. Yeah. I mean, really, my first step is like dry erase markers. Right. You know, it's like I'm going to work on a dry erase board. I'm going to, we're going to, you know, chicken scratch a bunch of ideas out. And once we get on a, in, a, in a good place, then we're going to go out and, 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 and put, you know, hammer to nail and all that stuff. But yeah, I'm very, I'm very physical. I'm very like 3D. I mean, 3D mixed media. It's, it's, that's, that's what I do. Yeah. So, um, uh, yeah, I mean, it's really kind of scary to take, scripts and ideas from you guys sometimes because <laughs> I I have I've been good enough to, to give you guys a little more freedom with your writing I, I feel like yeah, you I know really like agree it, with that completely it's it's like okay we've, we've we've got someone who can take care of our department now well enough that we don't have to feel limited in what we're writing and we can feel comfortable about moving forward with things that are maybe a little out of the ordinary or um, hard for for say a set or a prop 
Well, let so. me give you a, a very clear example of exactly what you're talking about. Is when, if you look at the way the, the company started, Rooster Teeth, it started with Red vs. Blue. Mm -hmm. And Red vs. Blue is inside of the world of off-the-shelf retail Halo machine. Where, you know, I couldn't do, in those days, I didn't really have the knowledge base to make visual effects. I could do, like, crappy little inserts, like insert a grave. Mm -hmm. As long as nobody walked over that spot, I could just, like, <laughs> paste it in there with a layer in Photoshop. Yeah. You know, so the writing that we had to do was essentially we've got this closed world, very closed world, and we have a jeep, and we have a skull, mm -hmm. and we have a couple of guns. Make that funny. Like, do something with that. And it was a world where that's awesome. So we came it's up, something. and so even like if you look down the road years later, I was still as a writer employing those techniques, like it when coming up with a concept for day five, which is a big show for us now. Back when we first came up with it, my idea was I want to make an apocalyptic show, but I want to make one that we can make. Yeah. And something where the world empties out and there's not, you know, tens of miles of cars abandoned choking the freeways and, you know, the, the nature's not reclaiming the cities. That's oh. the kind of stuff we weren't going to be able to. That's awesome. Uh -oh. All <laughs> I would say that that one was a failure. <laughs> you made a lot of progress, though. So this red bar get... at the bottom is. Oh, that's how much progress I've made. Yeah. So I think you're supposed All to kill right. a lot of the dudes. Oh, well, maybe I can just ride around and kill dudes. Yeah, you can ride around and kill guys. If I you... need to change my view a little. Let's see. I'm kind of stuck in here. So you should be able to change, I think, with... Uh... Is it this one? Yeah, this is an older game, and we both have played it, but so it's one of these things where we're rediscovering how to play it as we <laughs> no, go. No, the UA. Sorry, folks. You guys are like, there's no game playing here. But like, day five was is something like, here's an apocalypse that we can do, that we can make this. We can make a world where it goes to sleep one day and it just doesn't wake up the next. In yeah. fact... Uh, Joel's character, uh, in the first draft of it, uh, he was a guy who was up because he was working in a power plant, and he was third shift at the power plant. And it was important because he was he would explain to people why the generators can run, because once everyone goes to sleep, they go at reduced capacity um, for the city power plant, and then they had enough, uh, you know, automated maintenance and enough juice to be able to run for many days. So we get to like day nine, day 10, that's when generators might start failing at that point. But I didn't want to have to go through. The reason for that was I didn't want to have to go through and like edit, edit out streetlights or, you know, traffic yes. lights or those kinds of things. I want to explain why those things were all operating and the people just weren't there. Yep. So we would write like that and people would tell me, well, just write whatever and we'll make it work. And I was like, I was always so skeptical about it in the past, but over the past few years, now it's like things like laser team with like spaceships crashing from the sky like digital aliens standing right in front of us, you know, or, or you know, uh, monster effect aliens standing right in front of us. Those are things I feel like we can do now. Yeah, so it's been great. Well, awesome. Well, I'm glad that I can provide that for you. I mean, that's 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 ultimately what my job is, but it's really fun for me too. I mean, so you're saying I can I can write a day 120 now, so <laughs> where there's like weeds growing up. Through yeah, the, I think about that every time I watch Walking Dead. I think about every time they go down the road, it's like, whose job was it to put all these freaking leaves everywhere? Oh, yeah. Well, yeah, it's a greens department. Yeah, they have, I mean, we have, a, there's its own landscaping department. We, did, we haven't, we didn't really need it a whole lot on Laser Team, uh -huh. but we did have greensmen on the days where we were out at Spiderwood Studios. Um, when we dug that huge trench. Right. Um, From when the Antarian ship crashed. Uh-huh. Yeah. And then uh, we had to move around a bunch of dirt. We had to cut a bunch of trees. And there's just little things. It, you don't think about it. But somebody's job is to look at all those little, all those little details. Yeah. And it's so much fun too. You talk about that the the process of like having an idea like roll around in my head of something that I wanted to make for years. Uh, for day five, it was that that shot that we did with Joel, and we and then we kind of like built from that. But for Laser Team, the the shot that I always had in my head was something we wouldn't have been able to do, which was that big trench with the ship laying in it. That was like to me mm. the the image I always had in my head of Laser Team, the, the guys discovering the equipment. So yes. you guys going out and digging that trench. Going out there and standing there was like, wow, this is it. I mean, this is it was really so, there. Do you have yeah. that experience a lot when like you work with the directors or writers where they're like, you make the thing that they've been thinking about for a long time? Yes. Yeah. Oh yeah. No, I mean that's really a huge advantage for me as an employee at, at any company is I'm I'm getting to kind of fulfill your dreams and and that's I could not ask for a better job description. You know, I, I'm not the guy that, that's that's breaking your heart over some accounting nightmare. <laughs> you know, I'm 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 not that guy that's coming to you with some horrible problem i'm like look what we did and you guys are like we <laughs> <laughs> it really so. is it's so much like that like one of the 
one of the fun things you did on Laser Team was there's a scene where uh, Adam has an action figure of himself that the government built all these things for when Adam made his debut. Mm -hmm. There was like a PR component to it, and one of these things was action figures. And you found an action figure of Alan Richardson. Oh, well, listen, we got so lucky. That, does, that never happens. Let me just tell you. Like, if, if you tell me, oh, we're gonna, we need an action figure of this specific guy. It's gonna look just like that guy, not like any other guy. Not kind of like him. It needs to be that fucking dude right there. <laughs> and and I would just go, fuck, we're hosed. Yeah. Uh, and I we just got tremendously lucky. He played Aquaman in the uh, the like Superman WB Smallville. series. Yeah. yeah, in Smallville and. He had a character that was already made and was in a package. An action figure, yeah. It was kind of expensive. I think it was like sixty dollars. I think it was kind of a collector's item. But compared to making, you know, I'm sure there's some Smallville fans that are out there like, no, shouldn't like, have taken out of the package. You know, I, like I like bought the last two I could find on on eBay, and then I, like there are no, I don't know if there are others. <laughs> Oh really? So <laughs> you saying you bought out the I stock? I probably bought the last two Aquaman dolls and yeah, I would admit virtually that. destroyed them. That's okay. It was for a good cause, and yeah. and considering it was already Alan, like we couldn't have asked for a better a better thing. I had know? to laugh so, though because yeah. you took that Aquaman action figure, you turned it into Adam. And then you made all the little pieces of armor for it. Yes. And in fact, there was a thing on the set that day where Matt, you you made it, and in the script it said he took off one piece in particular. Yes. I think it was scripted as just the helmet. Right. And then we showed up on set, and I was like, "Yeah, check out how cool the helmet comes off." And he's like, "Well, what about everything else?" You know, like Matt had the turned on the puppy dog eyes on yeah. me, and he was like, "Well, well, <laughs> well, well, what about the arms and the and the boots?" And I was like, "Oh, fuck! You wanted all that?" <laughs> I was like, how would we have been able to do all that? If you think about it, like a boot doesn't really go on an action figure. Their 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 ankles don't flex. No, they have pegs. Yeah. Right. So it was like, I was like, how would I have done the boots? And uh, and to be clear, you had all the stuff, but it was on the action figure. Right. Fixed. Yes. Matt just now was like, oh, this is perfect. Now just make it removable. Yeah, I'm just make all the boots and all the things that are that glued onto the arms now come <laughs> off and go back on. And I was like, oh crap. I was like, how much time do I have? When are we shooting this? He's like, oh, in a few hours. <laughs> I was like, oh shit. So uh, I I think we I got I got about a quart of silicone and I made a custom little box out of out of styrofoam and cardboard that held a little negative space around the arms and legs and I had this doll contorted in this weird position so that I could do it and uh, I made little individual molds of just the arms you know the cannon the gauntlet the two boots the, luckily the helmet already worked right yeah. so I was so I was good with that. Uh, made a mold of those, cast them, hollow cast them out of plastic, used the alternative doll, the second doll that we had, that we hadn't used. Glad I bought the second one. Right. Um, painted his outfit to match, then took those hollow castings that we had from the first one and used those as on and off. When you do this kind so, of thing, do you feel like you're setting a bad precedent for yourself of like, hey, Marcus, just completely redo this in three hours? A little bit. <laughs> you know, it's like, and, and every, my, my crew always gives me a hard time. They're like, you keep, you keep doing it. You keep succeeding. They'll never say no. It's true. Yeah, yeah, it's true. Like, okay. The expectations I'm sorry. go through. And you have actually caused a little bit of a, a, a shitstorm, I would say, at the company uh -oh. because you built. I think it started really with the sports ball set. You built the sports <laughs> ball set. Everybody's like, "Well, that's a really cool set." And then you built the off-topic set, yes. and then it was like with a working beer tap and everyone's like well I want a new set <laughs> and it's like this thing at the company where in meetings where people talk about their set and there's just like well you know we should do podcast you guys already have a set it's like yeah but we want a, be we want a better set we want a market set well like, that's we almost took the we almost took the off uh, or on the spot set away from John and took it for the Rizzi podcast you were like well, this is ours now I was like it was it's so cool I'm desk. failing terribly at this game you're, look at this though you're so close um, Okay, well, I haven't done my cannons yet, but I can't steer it. I might I, take over for you here in a second. Yeah, you, please do. You want to you take over? Yeah. Yeah, go for All it. All right, I'm going to take yeah. over for Marcus. We're going to switch seats here. here. here I'll, and I'll I'm gonna pause move, this. I'm going to move over a little bit so we can... Okay, <laughs> so now I'm in here, and I'm way worse than Marcus at this. How oh, no. This really? Well, I haven't played in a long time. Like, I would play this game with Teddy and JD. How do I reset well, this? Well, I thing? love those drills. Oh, just, just you want to destroy the machine? You have the trash, the little trash bucket right there. All right, and, and then how do, I, how do I navigate? Uh, use fun. if you use your scroll wheel, you can zoom in and out. If you hold Alt, you can you can move around in 3D. Got it. Okay. I got Does that this help? Now. I think I'm getting there. If you want to attach something on the underside of it, you have to actually go far enough down to be able to attach. And C does the cannons. Y does this. How do I do the uh, How do I do the movement? Oh, it's the arrow. 
Arrow's got it. Front and back arrow. I'm I don't all... have a way to steer it though, so I'm just kind of depending on bumping into things to change my direction, and then <laughs> we can fix that. Yeah. Uh, here, I'll try to I'll try to build something that lets us <laughs> steer. Cool. All right, Marcus, I'm gonna try to find a different continent to get on here. Okay, cool. Yeah, I'm not I'm not super awesome at this game, so. Conquered. See, I've already conquered this one, so this seems like this is an easy one. Oh I've, yeah. I've, I've, I've See, this is where I started. Yeah. So this is one that's in the. In, oh yeah. This is just build something and get in there. This yeah. is great. Yeah. Oh, so you got, I got a little tutorial here too. So yeah, great. I didn't. I didn't. You know. You know me. <laughs> I just skipped right through the tutorial and went right for the build. <laughs> do you do that? Do you, uh, are you one of those people who like? Well, I'm not in real life, but in video games, I am. Oh, really? You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, I just want to play the game. Just get into it. Or yeah. Do you skip cutscenes and all that stuff too? Uh, I don't mind cutscenes. Depends on what it is. Oh, really? Yeah, because that's like part of the story, and I'm I'm into movies and storytelling, so I like the cutscenes. It gives me a break sometimes. Yeah, so how did you get your start doing all this stuff? Because that's a big question on game time. Is like, how did you get going on this? So how did you get how did okay. you get into the world of prop making? Okay, so it, it's it's all my dad. My dad is the whole reason that I'm into prop making. Really? We, he's a graphic designer, and you know, back in the '80s, you know, graphic designer was really more of an illustrator. So he's an incredible illustrator, always keeping a sketchbook. I grew up watching him make make incredible drawings, and it just sort of blew me away. That was like I just for someone to just take a pad and paper and turn that into something amazing just was it's a talent I wish I had all the time that and singing probably are the two big talents I wish I had gotcha but yeah he totally hooked me with his sketchbook is, is how he got me yeah so um, yeah we just spent a lot of times working in the garage and he, he he liked to work with wood and make little boxes and and fix you know fix things around the house he's pretty handy so um, you know he, he builds a lot of things just for fun and that kind of got me going yes. nice look at that look at that so right, okay. conquer I, yeah I conquered the first tutorial yeah. of it, so. <laughs> you're really good at this bird not so good um, so yeah my dad is really the, he's he's the he's my huge influence um, we would go to one of the big things was you know Star Wars of course and he made a, turned in out of a broomstick he made a blaster and um, and a lightsaber That's out, cool. of, out of a broomstick and some PVC and some electrical tape and you know hardware parts from hardware to kind of make a, a makeshift homemade prop and I just you know wore them down until they were nothing you know it's like all the paints worn away on them now there are they're like all the edges are softened you know and they weren't sanded before uh, all the little pieces on them all the little hardware pieces are broken and knurled down from having been drug around all over the place so they were like you know they didn't. They had toys in the '70s for Star Wars, oh. but it but it wasn't the same. You it know? makes me so mad. Like even like video games and stuff, people don't realize how good they have it now. Yeah. Oh. I mean, that, even cartoons. There was nothing. There was the movies, and yeah. then that was it. Yeah. So the, the whole cosplay New thing. Kids. Yeah, I know, right? There ain't no whippersnappers in there. Fancy props. But uh, yeah, Dad's totally the reason why I do this. And we went to Ghostbusters, and I w I just remember being like, I want to be a Ghostbuster for Halloween. And mm -hmm. my grandmother, so my dad's mom was a seamstress, professional seamstress. So that's, wow, that's all she like, did was make clothes. Um, and seems like you're like tailor made for the career you started. With, <laughs> I know, it's great the, tutelage. So get, get this. So my my dad's parents were, um, let's see, dad's parents were a boat and car mechanic uh -huh. and a seamstress. Then my mom's parents were a uh, a meat cutter and a homemaker. And so, and she's a teacher, and my dad's a graphic designer. So I feel like, yeah, I've got, I've got like a pretty good, I've got a pretty good blend of sort of like, you know, talents, luckily, that are kind of just sort of in my genes. But, uh huh. But really, this is so much about practice. Everyone always like, oh, that guy's so talented, and he can, he can do this, and he can do that. But so much of what I've done is because I've just done it so many times in a row, over and over and over, that I got good at it. So, and I hear that a lot you know, from from many artists is that it's just repetition, and you know, starting off like even drawing, which is like I said, a talent I'm super jealous of. Our cartoonist for the webcomic, uh, Luke McKay, he just said he he woke up one day, decided he wanted to start drawing, so he drew every day, and then eventually got to the point where it worked. Kind of like burning down this building, Marcus. <laughs> bring it all together. It's like I can shoot it. Or I can burn it, and eventually it'll it'll die on its own. Yeah, so. I think I spent thirty or forty minutes on that first level, and then I realized all I had to do was shoot a cannon at it one time, <laughs> and I was like, oh, well, hmm, all right, to each his own. <laughs> Moving on, zone two. That's, a, that's the educational process. I yeah. think here I'm going to learn not to go over a mine. That's <laughs> oh, exactly what I'm doing. Yeah, learning. wow. Yeah, that was oh, serious. that's what the spiky thing was. Now you learn how to. Yeah. I'm learning here. How do I delete a wheel? Okay, so there's the little um, the little eraser thing. Uh -huh. Click that, and then whatever part you go to, it uh -huh. goes away, and you can kind of sub, sub a in a new cut. thing. You should never watch Game Time 
if you are the kind of person who likes the game that we play, <laughs> because you'll be very furious at how poorly we play it yeah, while, we, or, while we talk about everything else in the world. Or the five minutes that I stopped completely to, to talk. Sorry about that. No, no, it'll be good. I'm going to find a way to put images of your work over the top of that. Cool. But yeah, to get back where we were, my I, I saw Ghostbusters with my dad, and you know, they didn't have screenshots. You know, there was no computers to pull up a trailer from. You you saw it in a the theater, or that was it. So, oh, look at your you steering. Weren't, you weren't watching frame by frame. Yeah, so, well, we were trying, but, you know, there was no way to actually do it. So, my dad went in with a sketchbook and just sort of, oh, sort of drew as much as he could. So, anytime they were wearing the plasma pack, you know, it, he was, like, trying to draw it. So, so when you say that, was he, like, in the movie theater doing yes. that stuff? Yes, yeah, we were together. I think we watched it three times in a row. I love it. So, we hung out in the theater most of the day. And we just paid for three showings, and then we hung out the whole time, and he just drew when hey, they were on screen. You're not going to watch it on home video, you know? You're not you're not going home. It doesn't exist. There's no such thing. You're not going to pirate right. the, the cammed version. Yeah, no, know? that wasn't a thing, you know? If it lived was, in New York know, City, go to I was going to say maybe if I was in New York or something, or like, you know, Chinatown maybe. I don't know. Oop, get but, out of here. Oh, all right, I'll give them There's a There's a lot of minds in that one. So you guys went to three showings of Ghostbusters and just sat there, and your dad would sketch... The different things. Yes. That's so awesome. Yeah, and then we would go home and we would try to make something close. And I think what we ended up with was like a Coleman backpack, a camping backpack that had those aluminum straps. Do you remember those old camping backpacks that had aluminum pieces that came over your shoulders? Not at all. Crazy stuff. Yeah. Um, anyway, so it started with one of those. We had a, like an old Ford uh, carburetor, like air filter top, uh -huh. you know, to give that silver sort of circular... Uh, thing. There's a toilet ball cock on there. There's a bunch of hardware parts and tubing and stuff. It's pretty silly. Uh, and then we used a Star Wars blaster and he built on top of it to look a little more like um, like Ghostbusters with like electrical wires and, you know, tape and stuff. Sounds awesome. Yeah, it's pretty cool. And then my grandmother so uh, made, you know, sewed a little jumpsuit for me, like a little tan jumpsuit, a little patch that had my name on it. And I wore uh, rubber boots, like green rubber boots, and I had a little leather belt that I tied in a way that could hold a flashlight. Um, pretty funny. And I think th I remember I was in third grade. Your first ever project. I yeah, love it. yeah. I was in third grade, and I think I won like best costume in the classroom. I imagine. Yeah. So so I got to go to the pizza party after school, and I was like, Score. that was like the bet. That was like, oh, I am sold. Pizza, I was like, pizza at school. Pizza pizza party reward for this costume. So you would you say that your first artistic project was profitable out of the gate? Yeah, it seems so. I mean, I you know, my I, well, it depends on what you would categorize my first artistic project, but yeah, I mean, right, I mean, sure. But You're yes, yeah, like my first formal. real attempt at like a movie costume, most, most, most certainly, yeah, it was a win. Yes, speaking of wins, that's yeah. perfect. Your timing yeah. on that was perfect. So that's awesome. So then, it, just from that point on in your life, did you just were you making stuff constantly? I kind of knew I wanted to make movies, but didn't know how I was going to figure out how to do it. Yeah, I knew I would probably have to go to school to really feel like I was qualified. Which is the worst. I know, and and really after having gone to school, uh, you know, considering the amount of debt I was in, I certainly reconsidered. <laughs> you know, I was certainly like second guessing that decision, but um, but I, I really felt like college was a good place for me to grow up and really figure out how to be how to be a man, how to how to be an independent person, and not what school? You know, Do you mind if I ask? It was College of Santa Fe. College of Santa Fe. It, it was a smaller liberal arts college. Mm -hmm. um, I don't even know if it's called that anymore. I think they've since been like you know you know the sad truth of liberal arts schools sometimes is. They get bought out and get a new name, and even though they have the same teachers and they're a really nice facility, it's like the name change just doesn't do anybody any help. You know, it just like discredits the whole yeah, sort of system. Somebody but, wants to put their own stamp on it. Basically. Yeah, exactly. But I will say, I had a really good group of professors. I ended up there with a really good group of people that just you know just like good people, like learning how to be an independent. And it wasn't so much that I was paying for school. I guess I was just like really paying how to how to like how to live a life not at home. You know, it's like how to be an adult. You know, I went to UT and it's kind of the same thing where it's such a big school. This is not working. Uh, that's a huge explosion. The, uh, <laughs> it was damage. such a big school that it's like I think I learned how to operate in a city. You know, or you know, without somebody looking after me all the time, which I had pretty much the rest of the way through my career in education was. You know, there's always teachers who were interested in me. Quite frankly, UT not so much. But, you know, I had a really good experience at college, so I was glad that I did it. Uh, and I, I am using my degree, so I guess I can't complain too much. That's pretty cool. So, not everyone can say that. Yeah, and my degree is actually in... <laughs> not everyone can say they're using your degree. Yeah. <laughs> I hope not. I've got my name somewhere on a, on a diploma. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I thought it was a good experience. Uh, you know, and considering that um, 
that like, really you're right. I mean, most people aren't able to use their degree even after having completed it and still paying for it. So no, I'm feeling pretty lucky. Yeah, yeah, it's it's cool. It's definitely cool to be able to do that for sure. Yeah, it's fun. So then from college, what happened? I moved to Austin, was working at Breeding Company, and if you guys have been have lived in Austin, you're probably aware. Breed, no Breeding Company really well. Yeah, Breeding Company is a small sort of mom and pop hardware sh- uh, store, like housewares kind of store, um, and it's local, but it's it's I don't know, it's kind of like Home Depot. I guess it's like an Ace Hardware. I guess is the best way to describe it for people. It's a small hardware. Independent store. mom and pop. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and, hardware store, way too expensive, and it is. It, it it's priced for convenience. It's in the middle of town. It's right by campus. It's right by campus. So, yeah, yeah. So, it makes back sense. when back when honestly, when college students would still do those kinds of projects. Yeah, I, mean, that's I would true. go to Breeding Company because I needed yeah. nails or I yeah. needed a wrench for working on a car whatever. that I didn't yeah. have. And really, that's you know that's that's where my 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 professional start in the industry got was was construction, doing construction, working at a hardware store, helping people on their homes, um, helping people build their houses. You know. So I did a lot of wood construction in college. Um, that's kind of where my basic skills and feeling comfortable around power tools and that kind of stuff comes from. So if you've got any carpentry experience, then you know, people are, are in a pretty good position to do our department. Yeah. So Well, I, do you ever think in the back of your head, too, entertainment is, it's I said in the game time with Meg, it's a tough field in which to make it, but it's also a tough field to maintain a career. So do you ever have in the back of your head that maybe you could go back and do construction for a living as a fallback? Does that still um, enter into your mindset at all? Oh, sure. Yeah, I mean, I feel like I will always be a maker, no matter what, where I'm doing it or uh-huh. who I'm doing it for. Um, yeah, I, I could totally see myself having my own furniture line or having sculptures that are, you know, custom sculptures that are made to order to spec. Yeah, I would absolutely. Line. That's interesting. Yeah, I, I, would I don't absolutely think I've ever heard anyone say that. But yeah, it makes well, sense to me now I mean, that you say it. I like I like shapes and forms. I, I like furniture. You know, a lot of production design is is finding interesting furniture. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's it's not always easy to put uh, a group of guys and girls at at a table and chairs and have it be fresh every time. Right. So you know, in considering that a lot of our content is is formatted that way. I've got to find a new cool way to put you guys at a table and chairs each and every time. Mm -hmm. Um, So I'm constantly on the lookout for cool furniture, and we usually end up making our own uh, just because I can't find what I want. What's an example of something you've made that people would have seen Um, on our our sets? Oh, well, something you would have seen. Well, like the Heroes and Halfwits table. Oh, I have a very good example. So on the spot, John John Reisinger's desk from on the spot, the console desk that kind of looks like it's part desk, part TV. Right. Um, I knew that he wanted a desk. He wanted to. He wanted to feel like he had something that he could own. <laughs> you know how John in the show he always gets pushed around. He's like, I need a desk. What? I need, he's like, I need. I need some. I need a, a like a like a layer of protection. You know. He's like in a way. He's like. I need some separation from between me yeah, and the animals. Yes. He was like, I just need the slightest. You know, separation here. And I was like, okay, let's give you a console desk. And then at some point, I knew that I wanted to see. I knew that I wanted to see some graphics down low, and, and that was kind of always how we had it. The The motion graphics would always appear right more or less where his legs were. Uh-huh. So I felt like, well, let's just kind of own that and put it on the TV here and combine an old console, like, wood panel TV with the desk. So we did a couple of Photoshops, put that together, and I, I tried to find something like that, but it just didn't look right. So we just made it from scratch. Wow. wow. So you just, all the way you just say that. So we just made it from scratch, a, a combination <laughs> well, TV desk. I mean, it sound, you're right. I, I make it sound simple. It's not. You know, it was it was a couple of days of, of planning and finding the right TV to fit the specs of the of the opening, um, and then trying to make the make the wood fit around the TV. And another challenge was making the TV look like it was old and vintage. And, yeah. Uh, you know, on a traditional flat screen TV, that's not easy. That that format alone already puts you into modern day. It's not a square, right? So I was like, okay, how do we how do we make this rectangle look like it came from a long time ago? And the solution was actually to do a curved bezel, which just means it's a frame that has curves. So when you look at the on-the-spot desk and you look at the TV, and it looks like it's a curved screen, that's why we've put in a, a, a frame piece that's 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 mimicking those curves that you see on a TV like that. Okay. So, but yeah, that's probably the best example, and that that's totally from scratch. Um, I want to say I found a desk and a console TV in the same 10 minutes that I was, you know, doing research for the show, and I just sort of saw the two together on on, on the page and was like, oh, we totally have to mash those up. So it was pretty cool. And is that to, when you have to get inspiration for something, is there like a go-to that you do, like for 
like you have, like you talked about Frank Miller having oh, his um, catalogs. Do you have anything like that? It could be anything, really. Mm -hmm. And that's, and that's in, you know, you always hear that in design shows. It's like, oh, it could be a throw pillow, or, you know, we base the whole room off this sculpture, or, you know, that kind of thing. Um, it's all about tone, I in my experience. It, it, could, it really could be anything. It could be a photograph, it could be a painting, it could be a pillow, it could be a sheet. Um, there's a lot of things that, that really get you going. Um, for example, we have some shows coming up, and Patrick did a couple of graphic designs that were so good that I knew immediately what the set needed to be. And so this is when you talk when you say Patrick, you mean Patrick uh, Schmidt? Yeah, who does graphic design, not Patrick who runs the broadcast department. Correct. Even yeah. though they might be for a broadcast we, show. Man, we have like three or four Patricks now. I think, it's so. always a thing yeah. where when we hire somebody, we hire somebody with a similar yeah. sounding name. We even have a Gavin now. Another yeah, Gavin. I know, I know. There's no Marcus. That that so poor far. bastard. Well, you'll see. You'll yeah. happen. Trust uh -oh. me. Mar yeah. Marvis is hi being hired next week, huh? And it's, it doesn't necessarily even have to be. So well, I totally killed that. Oh, you need some braces in there. I do. I yeah. that thing. That thing, like, as soon as I fired the cannons, they all just kind of took <laughs> off. All right, let me see if I can get in here. And I think Y is for the uh, flamethrowers. Yeah, that'll do it. I don't think yeah, flamethrowers going to do much of that castle, though. Let me yeah. see if I can get my structural stuff going here. But, yeah, like, we, we, we have a show uh, coming up that Patrick submitted some just some graphic designs for, and it was like just having seen that was enough for me to go, oh, I totally know where the show is going. Well, it was like, is that, is that simple? Uh-huh. So, um, yeah, because, you know, there's, there's certain colors, there's certain tone that you get from a font. Um, you know, immediate, I, well, I don't know, maybe not for you, but for me, when I look at a font, I can immediately tell whether it's it's childish, whether it's classy, whether it's modern, whether it's you know, traditional, depending on the serifs and the shapes and the way they're, the way that things are laid out, they just gel. So yeah, he sent some designs that were really, really nice. I love to hear about that kind of stuff too, because those are the kind of jobs when we first started where it was like, we didn't have two people in those positions it was the person mm, you know mm -hmm. it's like you need more than one vision as part of a process you know what i mean it's got to be you know because you draw inspiration from each other and what other people yeah. do well so. and and there, i wouldn't say there's a competition to it but but you know all artists in general are sort of competitive by nature in, in my in my opinion well maybe not all of them but mm -hmm. the artists that i work with there's sort of a like you know like a you you help you you push each other in a way like you see that person who's really good and you go oh I want to I want to be that good yeah you know and so then you, you you put extra effort into it to try to get there and so is everyone else around you they may be seeing something that you're doing differently than them and they're going oh man I want to be like that guy so so if you can end up with a whole group of artists that are all working together going man I want to be like you then that's that's like the coolest thing that you can ever ask for. And you can avoid design flaws like this. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> the device that just kills itself. It's essentially. A, you know, it's what it's, holds it's one of these in place. I don't hold it. I don't know if it does. A remote grenade. What's this? I've, I've never seen that before. I don't know. There's Explosive a rocket. Get out of here with this business. The, the problem I found with this game though is it doesn't always point the the business end of the of the gun in the direction you want. This is gonna be great. <laughs> <laughs> this is gonna be so awesome. Yeah, there's a way to rotate it, and I forget what it is. All right, I just haven't figured it out then. Uh, let me see if I can. Because at one point I was trying to use the, uh, I was trying to use the flamethrowers as a means of propulsion, <laughs> but it was it wasn't working. It was just like putting out fire and it wasn't moving. So I was like, oh well. I do like this game though. It's, it's a fun it's game. It's cool. I mean, really, this is one of those games that I would have to sit down for hours you know and like really noodle around yeah i mean you could you know. i mean it seems to me in a game like this that you could go nuts it, it really yeah i mean i see this game as being more about building these things to your liking than it is about conquering these levels oh absolutely you know because because there are simpler ways to destroy these levels do you know what i mean like oh absolutely it, the example was that the when i first did it it was like <laughs> <laughs> it just bounced off do i have to do i have to make it detonate as well i don't know Get in there. Oh, oh look at that. That go. was total luck. That was total oh, I luck. I haven't used that one. That one's awesome. Yeah, that might be it. That might be a little overpowered <laughs> for some of these weapons. All right. That was pretty cool. All right. Well, here, I'm just going to try to... It's, I like to like try to use the same siege machine to do several levels. But what was your... So then, after, you know, being an enthusiast and making the Ghostbusters costume and I'm assuming making a lot of things over the years, what was your first... Like, what was your moment when you feel like you broke into entertainment? Oh, it was definitely Spy Kids too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I was working at the hardware store, I was kind of ho humming through you know my life at that point. It was a year or so, a year or two out of college, just knowing that 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 I could I could do something really cool, but just not sure how to connect mm -hmm. to to the right people in the right way. You know, 
just like how do I how do I get in? You know, was that was that's the big question. That's what everyone's always trying it is. to figure out. It definitely seems um, like a locked game. You it, know, it is. It's not. It's very frustrating. It's 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 not going to be good to you. It's you know I'm not going to lie. Yeah. It's it's not going to be easy. There's too many of us who want in. There's not enough jobs. You yeah. know what I mean? There's just there's And honestly just, there's a lot of people trying to maintain their careers too. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there's just there's just too many there's just too many people who want a piece of it and there's just not enough happening here for for it to be for everyone. So it's really When you hard say to here, do you mean in Austin? Well, yeah, I do. Yeah. But um Atlanta right now is a really good place for people who are wanting to get into film industry. Um, LA of course there's always work there uh, it's a little bit different place I like LA it's just it's different than Austin um, but it's different everywhere you know Atlanta's the same way um, is there like a traditional path for what you do is like an apprenticeship yes okay. there there is a there is a traditional path um, now depending on what state you're in there are film commissions and there are film societies mm -hmm. if, if check to see if your state has a film society or film commission if they do then they're gonna be the best resource you've got for connecting to film industry work um, t I started as a production assistant. It's also known as a PA, uh, and that's that's the typical in for most people who want to do that film. Is entry level. Yes, yeah. it is. I mean, you really are going to be the gopher. You're going to be the guy that goes and picks up the laundry. You're going to be getting people's coffees for crew. You're gonna you're gonna pick up people's lunches. You're gonna run all the errands. You're gonna go shopping for art department. You're gonna pick up stuff for for wardrobe. Um, they're gonna send you out in the middle of the night. They're gonna wake you up early in the morning. You're going to be doing stuff that's not super fun. Yeah. Um, but you can almost bet that the good majority of the people that you are working with and around have done that position before and have put in that same hard work and effort to, to get that. And it's so, a position, I would say, that most people approach as entry level. And they just kind of do their job. When you get somebody who does that job really well and has a lot of ambition, they really shine. That's true. In fact, a lot of people stay as PAs for a really long time, and they can they have a hard time understanding why they're not excelling. And it's because they took the PA position too literally. Mm -hmm. they, they we want to see you shine. We're, that PA position is is to see where you where you fall. Yeah. And you can either blow us blow us away with your dedication and your hard work and your attention to detail or what have you, or you can just treat this like oh I'm just the errand boy. And I can guarantee you're not going to go a whole lot past that. You know, you're going you're gonna to be in that PA position for a long time. You know, and it's one of those things, too, when you talk about starting a career. We talk about different projects you work on. You can very quickly list off Spy Kids movies, like you can say Spy Kids 2 through 4, uh, you know, Sin City. This is a decade or more of work. That's yes. like these, This is not a quick process. Although no. when people describe it, it sounds like a very quick process. I think I did PA work for three or four years. Um, I, I didn't always work as a PA. Well, it's funny. They didn't always credit me as a PA, but I was being paid as a PA on a lot of movies. Interesting. You know, I, it's one of those things where they need entry-level people. Mm -hmm. uh, they can't afford skilled labor, but they need people who know, who have skills. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so they're You're like, well. skills I'm like trying to like yeah. just totally <laughs> cheese this, yeah. this rocket. <laughs> Uh, there you go. Oh. No, it's not gonna blow up in time though. I'll you, figure this out. Either way, yeah. I mean, Can it's I up this it's one of those things where you've you've just you've got to be able to you've got to have that skill set. You know, you've got to be able to use that skill set to your advantage. I'm gonna throw the smaller machine. Okay. You got some you got some sheep. You got some blood. I can, I can almost get up this. I just need a smaller machine. That's it. All right, so I'm gonna save this guy. Click. Oh, look at that. Oh, look at these. Like, oh, maybe Whoa. I can bust out one of, my, one of my older machines. These are your saved ones. Yeah. Oh, shit. I'm going to this is my Marcus Game Time machine. Look, like, I've got a bomber in there and everything else. Damn. Like, oh, bring those this. up. Let's see that Let's stuff. I love it. Catapult. Catapults. <laughs> this one is just a destroyer. Okay, let's see how this works. Yeah. No, so, that's... this is rubber bands and, like, uh, let's, uh, like kind of a pivot here. Yeah. Um, wow. Let me, how do I fire this, though? How do you fire a catapult? Um, Let me find the bands. I was gonna say if you can find it down here, it'll tell you. Uh, there's a way to restrict the bands. Uh, here it is. L contractible spring. I'm gonna assume that's it. All right, let's see. Let's go ahead and play and see. What is it? L. Okay. All right. Yeah, but it's it can be a very long process. Whoa. Do you have to keep? Oh, good job. Oh, wow. Okay. All right. So now I just gotta figure out how to get it closer. <laughs> Damn it! You can't. You can only do that once, huh? Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, it's meant for. Yeah. But, but you know, I could probably do it in such a way that. Alright, we're gonna get this. We're gonna get this. I can feel it. That was pretty good. Man, I guess. You impressed? Did I get a job? Yeah, you can come and work for us. Alright. 
No, I just heard a lot of it, but not, not all of it. Just, all right. You can start as a PA. Does that sound okay? <laughs> it sounds good, man. <laughs> sounds good. That's about where my uh, that's about where my skills are. All but, right. but yeah, if, if someone's trying to get in the film industry, that's that's the best way is to get a PA position, and and which and won't be easy either. It's not going to be easy, but if you get it, man, please kick some ass for your, for everyone's sake that's involved with that production. Because if you do a really really good job, they're going to take notice and they're going to ask you back. And you think film film commissions and looking for that. Those, yeah. those are positions that are advertised. They are. I mean, they don't advertise often for DP. I'll, I'll use Texas as an example. Texas Film Commission or the Austin Film Society are the two best resources for us here in this in this region. Um, they have all the productions listed. They have the producers and the hiring you know the hiring department heads listed online. So you should be able to, if you're clever, you should be able to go in there, find the production name and a, and a point of contact, and you that, at that point you could you know I mean. Cold emails aren't always, you know, aren't always read by everybody. But listen, it's it. There's it doesn't it doesn't hurt to try. You get a lot of emails after this. You realize that, right? Well, yeah, I get a lot of emails. That's that's how it goes. Yeah, that's how it goes. I get a lot of emails as is. I think I want to say I had my uh, I had my email listed on IMDb one time, uh-huh. and that was a huge mistake because it was like anyone who was going seeing any of my credits was just like coming straight to me. It was like you know just targeting me basically at that yeah. point. Yeah, and I was like, oh, I can't deal with this. So. I want a bigger box. <laughs> I get a bigger box. <laughs> All right. Let me see if I can do this. Maybe if you add something to it, like... <laughs> Ooh. That didn't work out so well for me. That did not. What if we... We should just add a weapon. Like, uh... A rocket. Something. <laughs> Let's add so a rocket. We, so we can get a second pass. You know what I mean? Yeah. I think I think that, that would help us here. Maybe gonna... if there's some cannons on the front here. Yeah. Along this edge. Wait, what do you mean? Around, around up here? Like, you can put cannons on this... On these nodes. Ah, point okay. them that way, maybe? Ah. Maybe where there's not a rubber band. Cannons. Here we go. You can zoom in if you want to get out of that snow. There you go. Yeah, there you go. I think all the cannons you could put. Oh yeah. Look at all those. Yeah, it's gonna fire at the. Uh... <laughs> maybe I can, maybe I can time this in such a way that it'll go one and then the other. Okay, let me see. Play. Well, when you hit C, it'll go. So if you boom and then cannons. Yeah, cannons already went. Hold oh. On a no, I, I, I fired them, though. So we'll do the catapults. And then the cannons. Cannons oh, don't do much. Wow, the cannons didn't do shit. Yeah. Wow. Oh, I, I used regular cannons, too, not shrapnel cannons. So maybe I should use shrapnel cannons. Okay. We'll try this. This will be our last our last one we do here. Oop! Oh, I shouldn't do that. Redo, undo that. Uh, this will be our last one we can do. Okay. I think we'll be stuck on this one for a little while. But, yeah, it's uh, putting your email out there is, uh, you know, a, a cold email is... Uh, rarely gonna work, but rarely is better than not gonna work. Right? Well, I, I will say, if I get a cold email that has a really terrific portfolio, I'm going to drag and drop it and put it in my little black book, and I'm gonna hold on to it. Such a common thing that's said on Game Time is make your own work, build a portfolio, you know, hone a craft. Those that's time you're never. It's never wasted if you yeah. do that stuff. You're building a skill set, and you're building a, a demonstrable catalog of work that you can show to somebody. Yes. Well, and that's the easiest way to prove to me you know what you're doing. Doesn't it just apply to, to production design, art direction, also to things like Let's Plays or podcasts? Sure. It seems very easy to sit down at a microphone with a video game and go, look, I've even stopped playing a video game while I'm saying this, <laughs> is to sit down at a video game with a microphone in front of you and just play the video game and be entertaining it's it's a those guys that can do that it's a huge skill set it, it is well and everyone seems to a lot of professional industries are taken for granted like that especially mm -hmm. in entertainment because it just seems like oh this is all you got to do is, is is say a couple of lines from the script you know everyone always gives actors and actresses a hard time you know they're right. always like oh all you got to do is go in and say a couple lines and go home it's like nah, it's a lot more than that in know, a lot so of ways though too it's like the best compliment is that somebody you know, you make it look easy. Mm -hmm. You know that that's that's I think yeah. a good compliment, but it's a tough one to hear. Yeah. Well, and it's funny you mentioned that because that's like some of the some of the things that I had to do to sort of defend what I did here initially. Um, really. Like when I first started here, it was really hard to kind of get everybody on board. You know, it was all it's a whole new direction. Like taking production design seriously and being willing to invest in it is a thing. It's and, true. And yeah. it's it's there's a lot more money involved when you start to take take the art direction. To, to, to the next level. Mm -hmm. And so for us as a company to really take that seriously, I was having to kind of stand up for doing things that maybe were a little different around here. And that wasn't always easy. So that was I got I got that quite a bit, you know, when I first started. No, it totally makes sense. Yeah. It's like, especially when you're the person coming in, it's like, 
We're yeah, spending he, how much? Didn't we spend yeah. uh, like one tenth of this the last time we did something similar? Yeah, they were just like it just was hard to really understand why we would need to spend that money, and I kept having to kind of go to bat for it and show examples and be like, this is this is a new direction we're going. This is this is something that we have to we have to take seriously if if this is if this is why I'm here. Well, I would also argue now that you, in, in credit to the effort that you put in to do that. You are now probably one of the people that if, you know, you come up, you have a much easier time getting the, the money and the funds or the production budget that you need to get stuff done. That's you know? true. Yeah. yeah, no, I, I've been here a little, well, I guess I'm, if you count the subcontracted work, I've been here about two years. When you say subcontract, so, you mean laser team? Uh, no, uh, day five uh, short that gotcha. we did, right. and then iBlade was uh, two two projects that I did as a subcontractor for you guys and gotcha. I met with you guys initially in February of January January or February of 2014 was when we discussed laser team uh -huh. like the very first time was when I had you guys in a room and we talked about it so that was kind of like my introduction to you guys and that's all that's a little over two years ago wow that's crazy so yeah um, definitely yeah I felt like the first year was really um, an important time for me as an employee here was to show you guys that we really can do this. You, you know, like as a company, we really can take this seriously. We really can do the big things that you want to do. Yeah. Um, I just need an opportunity to show you, you know, and so some, it was hard to convince people to give me, you know, the money that I needed to do that. But I think once we did it a few times and people got a little more comfortable with it and they were seeing results and, you know, and that's, that's, that's all it takes. Or we got people who were like, I want, yeah, I want Marcus on my thing. <laughs> you know, the people are fighting over who, who Marcus is getting to work for. Well, that's great. That's, I mean, that's. I couldn't ask for anything better than that as as an artist. What do you uh? So, so something's going on here. I, don't know what's, I hear people yelling in the background. What's uh? What's, what's the thing, thing you're working on these days that you're excited about? Oh god, I don't know. Can I you talk can about talk it? about it. Yeah, sure. Talk about it. And we can always like. Adam was it. all worried about it. He's like, don't talk about it. Oh, you mean you, so you can talk about the show you wanted to well, make? Well, I don't about know. It? I don't know. I mean, I guess. Well, uh, uh, here's what I can't talk about. Like right now, immersion is is really super fun for us. It's we're taking that in a, uh, to a level that we haven't taken it before. Yep. We're doing things that we always wanted to do but didn't feel like we could right. or could take seriously. Um, yeah, we're doing a lot of fun things there. I think that's probably where I'm having the most fun right now. Um, yeah, immersion's is, a blast. It is. I mean, I, I a lot of the video games that we recreate are are so modern that I don't have a whole lot of like a whole lot of experience in them, but it's fun because I get to kind of I get to kind of like experience that fresh and new with the episode. So I'll go out and buy the game that we're recreating and I'll play it for a little while and that's fun, you know. It gives me re I guess when I was growing up, I always felt guilty when I was playing video games. Like I felt like, "Oh god, I'm supposed to be like I was I'm same supposed way. supposed to be like preparing for my career and if I'm playing these video games and I'm not then I'm not doing that." So I remember feeling a fair amount of guilt when I was younger because it's, it's not video games aren't the same aren't the same now as they were then. Like video games in the eighties and nineties, a lot of parents saw that as like a huge distraction and a huge you know like this go, is go not, outside, go yeah, outside. Like, this is not yeah. a healthy activity for you to be doing sitting right. on the fucking couch all day. So I remember feeling a fair amount of guilt behind that. So um, same. So now when I get to play video games, and I don't have that guilt. It's it's like it's a totally different experience for me. I don't have to feel like I'm. Oh, I can only play this game for an hour, and then I got to go back to work. Go mm -hmm. back to what I'm doing. Um, you know, I can stay up all night if I want to. <laughs> Just yeah, I'm an adult. Yeah, exactly. So you know, and I have two little girls now that are three and five years old. So I feel like I'm 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 in a I'm in like the perfect. Ooh, look shot. at me! Look at that! So it's all about that thing, not save the middle that. part. Yeah. See, I didn't realize that. We could have saved ourselves some steps if we knew that. We might have aimed a little higher. Well, little... I was I I think I I knew that was the case. I almost want to do that one again <laughs> just to prove You're that so, I can. So satisfying. That we're, no, but I'm worried that I won't be able to move on if I don't. Um. So, so this was a victorious game time. Unbelievable. Never never happened before ever. <laughs> awesome. I like your weapon though. Thanks, man. You got like a streamlined version of the first one. But you and I, uh, what I was kind of getting at, did they shoot my bombs with arrows? That's that's. Did they? That's inaccurate. Oh, yeah, they did. Maybe just get a little closer. Can you get any closer? Yeah. Where you doing? Right oh, no, be careful though, because my, my construction's not the best. Oh. <laughs> oh, so I guess if, it, if an arrow hits you, it just they they go. I'm gonna oh. give myself some support so these things don't fall all the way down. So they can go like this. Oop, did that wrong. No worries. So um, so one of the things though I was kind of getting at with that conversation is oh, I don't want to connect that um, was you and I talk frequently about a build it show and that's mm -hmm. immersion is definitely heading more in that direction I think which yes. is great but I wonder if the audience would really like a show where stuff is built on a regular basis like that's the purpose of the show sure well we we are sort of developing some of that and we're at the moment we're kind of caught in development you know as, as they say 
Um, just trying to get everybody on the same page with, with how it works and what we're going to do. That was awesome, dude. Yeah, it's charged in there. This is this is my new uh, go-to siege machine. I'm going to save this bad boy. What's that one, the catapult? No, this is the this is the <laughs> kitten pult. This is the there you go. version of that. <laughs> there you go. The kitten pult. Kitten pult. That's pretty good. Nice. All right, what am I supposed to do here? Oh. Steal and deliver a wood pile. What is this? Not gonna work, go work in construction? Wait. See, this is the fallback plan. So we can't destroy any things in this one? No. It's, oh, it's, that's no. lame. Came, whoa. <laughs> well, that was funny because when I went. Oh. All right, I'm gonna start yeah, working on a whole new device. I, I don't think I'm gonna to, finish this one though. Let's start over. Yeah. So I gotta build something that can. Uh, I'm gonna build something that can can hold a. Uh, can pick up stuff and grab it. So let's just use the grabber. But yeah, a builder show is definitely something that we'd like to do. Um, you know, I love I love building props in general, so that's certainly something w where the focus of the show would be. Um, but you know, hey, is we just trying to figure out where it belongs and and how big of a production is this? You know, like kind of trying to understand where that where that is. But yeah, I would love to do a builder show. Yeah, I think I think it would be a lot of fun to do something like that. It's uh, but it's you know. There's a lot of things that we would like to make that we'll see, you know, what our audience wants to watch because, you know, we're kind of known for a certain thing and narrative stuff. But I think immersion is a great stair step towards something like that. Oh, absolutely. Who yeah, knows? I mean, uh, I mean, I don't have a whole, pardon me, uh, I don't have a whole lot of Twitter followers, but the ones that I do have are pretty vocal and they're constantly bringing that up. Has so has the experience so. of working like Troublemaker? You work on very high profile projects, mm -hmm. but at Rooster Teeth kind of every job is a high profile job like true do you feel like even having worked on big hollywood movies what's been the personal impact of you since you came to work at rooster teeth oh well it's been tremendously different than troublemaker even though we're on high level projects multi-million dollar movies the crew don't really have the, the, no one knows about the crew no one no one really cares about the crew on, I on movies like that. i liked you um <laughs> well you know what i mean though it's I know, like I know people exactly aren't I mean. seeking out the crew to to like know more uh -huh. um but that's completely not the way it is here at rooster teeth um i the crew is definitely as 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 revered as as cast members here at rooster teeth which is pretty special it's not something i'm used to um yeah and all in the decade that i worked at troublemaker studios not a single person you know, it was like, oh, oh, you're that guy. You know, that's that just didn't happen. So to be here at a place where people appreciate But when you, you talked about a project you worked on, they were like, oh, yeah, I've seen that a thousand times. Oh, sure, yeah, yeah. But, it, you know, you you had to bring that up. You had to say that. Sure. You know, it's like I've got to – I'm don't. i not one to sort of tout my own – you know, toot my own horn a whole uh -huh. lot. And I just never really felt comfortable being like, oh, yeah, I, I, I work in the – you know, like that's not my – it's not my first point of, of like conversation with people unless you. unless you ask me. And at that point then it's like then it, then the whole conversation turns into that. You know, like um I like for example when I went to Christmas with my wife, you know, when she was my girlfriend, right? And we were getting a little more serious and so I would go to the family functions. So when I was there, you know, of course they'd be like, Oh, it's Martin you know, they would call me they would like call me every name except my actual name. <laughs> uh, and then, you know, Classic after, Martin. Yeah, and then like like a couple years later it was like the cup still said like Melanie's husband, you know, on really? that stuff. So that's great. So but then one year somebody found out that I somehow it came up in conversation that I worked on movies and then it was like all of a sudden everybody in the room wanted to talk to me all night long. Really? So yeah, it was like just it, for for whatever reason, just like something about me working in movies, just I became interesting to them by default, and and it, you know it was like one of those things where I was like, well, this is really cool. I'm I'm glad that you know people are you know actually care to talk to me now here. Um, but yeah, it's, you people know, are like, wow, did you talk to Martin about it? <laughs> yeah, they're like, did you hear about Martin? So I made yeah. a forklift here. I'm pretty I'm pretty dude. I saw that. Pleased with that. I so. know. Here we were mad about. Not being able to blow stuff up, and you just went over and picked it right up. Yeah, I could. I'm telling you, I could. I could if, I, if I lose a job here, I can get they a job. Come to, right over to our department on the loading dock you, somewhere. Get you on the forklift. <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna yeah. bust out your. Uh, I'm gonna bust out yours here. So, what else should we talk about today, Marcus? Um, what would you? I mean, the big thing is like, you know, what do you see like for for if someone wanted a job at Rooster Teeth, they hmm. wanted to work in the art department, they wanted to work for Marcus, like, what would be the best path for them to do something like that? Okay, so, so the, well, the best path is to really try not to lose focus on yourself, first and foremost. Like, don't don't think as of Rooster Teeth as being in-game for you. You know, you need to you need to focus on just you as an artist is, is the first and most important thing. Because 
the things that you may create now and the things that you may be interested in now may not be the same things that you're interested in 10 years from now. True. So it's important to kind of focus on your skill set and on yourself as an artist. Um, try to build your own confidence if you don't have any. That's it's 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 a really important thing to work at any company at any business, no matter whether you're an artist or not. Like you've got to be able to interact with people confidently. And, and if you if you want to succeed in what you're doing, you need to be able to convince people of the things that you want and need. So uh, first and foremost, concentrate on yourself as an artist. Concentrate on yourself as a, as a person. Um, once you're feeling confident about that, you know, I, I feel like then you can start to take jobs and careers seriously. But, um, but yeah, I mean, it, it, the best way is to focus your skill set into a way that you've done something amazing. Do something for yourself. Blow me away visually with a short film, or a sculpture, or a prop that you've made. Um, maybe you're maybe you only do house construction, so that's fine. Put I'll put all your put all your finished carpentry work in a portfolio. Um, really, it's like I need to see what you can do. Everyone always sends me resumes, and the resumes are written, and I don't see. There's nothing. You're not hiring writers. There's like I. I I can't, there's nothing here for me to see. Mm -hmm. um, and they're like, well, if I could just meet with you and I could tell you how passionate I am about these items. And I'm like, look, I really just need to see any pictures. Yeah. You know, I'm a visual person. I'm a visual artist. I require visual, you know, visual aids. <laughs> you know, I get it. So, I mean, it's like everything you do and you produce is visual. In fact, you'll do that yourself. Yeah. When you're presenting ideas, yeah. you always make sure there's a visual component to something you're doing. Well, I'm glad those nights died now. Plus, I would say, if you're trying to get my attention with something artistic, um, please know that it doesn't necessarily have to be rooster teeth related or related to me or something that I do. You know what I mean? Right. It, it should be something that you're interested in, something that you're proud of. Maybe something that you could use as a portfolio item for any company. You know, like let's say you made a really cool thing and it's got rooster teeth branding all over it and it's like, maybe rooster teeth's not interested, right? But now you can't go use that somewhere else because it's got it's got somebody else's branding all over it, you point. know. Or yeah. it's, you know, like try to pick something that you feel you, that you identify with enough that could be used at lots of places, maybe to to, to interest people in your in your skill set. Your, that's a long process yeah. too. Yeah. Is there like a, a formal way besides like PAs? Like, is there like any kind of like like for a filmmaker you can make a movie and go to festivals? Is right. there anything? As, would you say cosplay is a good cosplay? After that? It, it is, and it didn't in ten years ago. You know. 15 years ago it wasn't that way but yeah absolutely cosplay is a it's a perfect way to get introduced to prop making um and and costuming in general yes i think that's an excellent supplement to to what i've already said yeah if you're interested in cosplay and there's something that's holding you back there's really there's really no reason to to buy into that you just need to go for it and just do it you know you can always make another costume you can always look better your first one may not look exactly like you want it and that's okay mm -hmm. you know you just keep doing it until it looks till it looks good and you, can, and you can watch people's skills when they when cosplayers start off. Their skills improve dramatically yeah. with every project that they work on. You know, um, one thing I, I want to ask you about before we stop this is mm -hmm. the different jobs of production designer and art director and everything. There's a lot of times when I go to talk oh. to you and you'll when I talk about what Marcus does for us, I say he just makes everything better. But it's like, <laughs> can you talk a little bit about those different jobs and what they are? Sure. Okay. So there's a lot of layers to to production in our department. Um, the, typically, the way it works is the the top head of the department is the production designer. Uh, they're responsible for exactly like it sounds, producing the design. So under a, pr a production designer, typically are uh, a single art director or a handful of art directors. D depending on how many projects we do, it, that kind of determines how many art directors we have at any given moment. Um, the art directors are kind of like the soldiers. They're the boots on the ground. They, he's, he or she is the, is, the, is the person who makes sure that all the things come together, get into the truck, and make it on set and look the way that they're supposed to look. Mm -hmm. um, they also would coordinate the shooting portion of what we do just to make sure that each individual uh, camera angle looks exactly the way that we want it to. Uh, you may not realize it, but every time we point the camera at something an art department person stands by and watches monitor and and will will go tweak things on frame so let's say maybe a picture frame's got a glare on it right. because they've changed the camera they're going to go and they're going to twist the picture frame just enough to make that go away perhaps a chair or a table doesn't look right because it's hidden behind another piece they're going to go push that an inch or two to the left or the right to make it you know and, and that's also something that the set dressers do. Um, the art director is kind of like the boots on the ground. Then you have set dressers, you have prop masters. Prop master is the person who does only what people touch. 
if they touch it or it's in their hand, it's a prop, and the prop master is the person who takes care of it. Uh, the set dresser was the most surprising job on Laser Team to me. Was the person who was like just would come up and take our, our equipment from us every single take. I was yes, like, that, but that, it was that, awesome to know where that person was. That's right. That, not having to keep track of that stuff. You don't want actors doing that stuff. That's right. The prop master has usually a couple of assistants. Then they're I'm totally gonna make. This yeah, at least you're walking. You're like you're like walking this <laughs> it's thing. The all most over pathetic the... thing ever. <laughs> I tried to like cheese it off the bridge, and then now I'm trying to cheese it into the actual. Oh, look at this. I like that you're using cheese as a verb. It's really, I like that. Yeah, that's my, that's my video game Cheese career. Cheese it over. Video game career yeah. in a nutshell. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, the set dresser, uh, they're the ones who set all the furniture. They put in the chairs, the tables, the the curtains, that kind uh -huh. of stuff. Uh, let's see, who else do we have? Uh, we have a scenic artist. They're the people who do all the painting. They you paint all the walls. Yep, you have greensmen's. They're the ones who do all the landscaping and trim the trees. And Is it greensmen or greensmen's? Um, Green people. I, you know, I don't know if they've, if they've taken it that far. It's kind of an old an old term. Uh -huh. um, but, yeah, it's always, yeah, greens person, greensman. Yeah. Um, let's see, what else is in there? Special effects coordinator. He's the guy who, or he or she's the guy who's in, in charge of just making sure all the effects run well. It's not going to let me choose it. Um, yeah, it doesn't like you. No. Yeah, I was say, this is a start over, maybe. Uh, wait, what do you have to do on this one? You have to ride the, ride the ramp? Yep. And kill all the no, soldiers? I kill the guys to, like, to let me ride the ramp in peace. I see. So, let's see who else is there. We've done prom master. That's the good majority of our department. If you had to do anything besides what you do, because I mean, even like even mentioning saying like making props, mm -hmm. it's like that's a basic part of what you do. That's a, yes. that's a sub component of what you do. That's correct. But you also it, it also seems to me like you're fine being described in that way. Is that yeah. there? Because that's well, where you get your start? Because that's where I start, yeah. And I mean, really, most of our department really are just artists, and, and they're really good at that one thing, but they've had to be pretty good at all the stuff mm -hmm. to get that far. That's that's the thing, is like, most most people in our department are going to have a really varied skill set. And that's and that's the, that's what I would want, you know? I want someone who's good at three or four things instead of just one thing. Um, it means I can, I can keep you on as a core member of the crew and, and not have to switch out lots of people depending on what's happening. I can go, well, I've got I've got this person who covers these three skill sets. I've got so and so who does the other two. I've got the stuff in between covered. So between the three of us, we've got the good majority of the things that would come up in our department taken care of. Um, and that's why I was, remember we talked about like having a guy or a girl for everything. Like that's that's why. You know, it's like Every good artist knows their limitations, uh -huh. uh, and not every artist will admit them. <laughs> so, uh, some of the best ones refuse to admit it. <laughs> uh, but what they do is, in the skill sets that they are not good at, they do a really good job of finding people who are mm -hmm. and and being really good to them. That's a metaphor for production in general, I think. Right? It's yeah. like that's that's you can't do everything, so you got to find the best possible people. To do stuff, and and I think that our relationship with you has been great. I think you're one of the few employees. That, like from day one, it was like, okay, let's let's have Marcus make everything we do a little bit better. Awesome. Well, uh, thank let's, you. Let's close on this. So, what was yeah. what so far? I know they're all your babies. What's been your favorite thing you've worked on? Oh, the the most like like to date. Yeah, Rooster Teeth. I specifically, think it was probably the immersion episode, the Warthog immersion episode. Really, you yes. liked that one the most? I did because I felt like um like uh, like we had everything we needed. Like mm -hmm. there was like nothing stopped us, really. There wasn't any, like we just I don't know. We had every we had everything figured out. Do you know what I mean? Like yeah. We'd spent a lot of time thinking about this one. Daniel Daniel and I put a lot of extra effort into try like pre planning, just like understanding that what we were doing was was it was sort of like a feat of engineering to be, you know, to like get past. Um, you know, hard. This is hard stuff. You yeah. Know, it's just math involved. You know, it's like most of what I do is art. But when you start to involve math and explosions and, you know, people's lives and safety, then it becomes a little more important and, and it's stressful. But whenever you succeed, it's just so much worth it. It's so worth it. Well, so. hopefully people by the time... Oh, look at that guy. set me on fire. <laughs> See, you're talking about safety. The one guy I blew up, he landed right. on my thing and set me on fire. So I'm just going to assume that I could have finished this level. <laughs> and it would have been amazing and everybody would have loved it. Marcus, thank you for coming to talk to us today. I had a blast talking with you and it has been an absolute pleasure to work with you. Looking forward to many years more of us working together. Thank you. Likewise. I fucking hate this game because it drives me insane. I am certainly not an expert, but I do love to play Super Meat Boy. Mm -hmm.